No hairdresser ever has to lead a double life. Now he can test a cute brunette and still be true to his wife. <laughs> but why sigh and yearn so much for the skin you love to touch? Satisfy the craving, finger-waving, trimming the women. This is How Would Lubitsch Do It, a podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It is October 1918, and Tim Brayton joins us today to discuss The Eyes of the Mummy Ma. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, or just to say hi. Welcome, everyone. We are here with Tim Brayton. Tim, do you want to introduce yourself to either new listeners or people who happen to listen to our previous podcast? I would love to. Yeah. So uh, I'm Tim, as, as Devin just said. I am a film critic slash podcaster over at Alternate Ending, which is alternateending.com. And, you know, I've been uh, writing reviews on that site or on my previous blog, Antagony and Ecstasy, since 2005. A member of the Online Film Critics Society, and I am also a PhD candidate at the University of Wisconsin Madison in their film studies program. A little bit of modern cinephilia, a little bit of history. Well, welcome, and thank you for so much for making the time to talk about this uh, possibly the most arcane movie that we're going to cover in this entire show. <laughs> Tim, you're one of, I think, two or three people, the third being Wes Anderson, that I can credit with. If, if I had not read something you wrote, this podcast might not have happened because uh, I think it was your review of the Grand Budapest Hotel where you connected it to Lubitsch. And I went, huh. And then Will mentioned that too. And at some other point, I read an interview with Wes Anderson where he mentioned Lubitsch too. And so that got me thinking I should check out this fella back in 2014. And the rest is history. I watched To Be or Not To Be and I kind of never looked back. I'm, I'm, I feel unusually honored i mean obviously every critic is happy when they've influenced anybody's film going choices but the fact that i was instrumental in getting you over to lubitsch is like well well i was doing the lord's work that day indeed so uh, then I, I want to throw this back to you um how did you hear about ernst lubitsch why should people care about this director who died what 75 years ago what made you want to take the time to talk about one of his most obscure hard to find and questionable movies uh, well, I, I think I can start with the, the last question first, because it's going to be, I think, probably the most straightforward. Previously to you announcing this project, I had not seen any of Lubitsch's silent German films. I'd seen a couple of his Hollywood silence, and mostly, as you know, I'm sure it's true, a lot of people uh, sort of came to him through his, his talkies, his uh, pre-codes in Hollywood. It felt like that was a pretty big lapse in my education, because I do love this director very much. And so... Part of it is just like, well, you're giving me an unavoidable excuse. <laughs> like, I, I have to watch at least this one movie because I've I've been given it as an assignment. When did I get into him? Now, that is a hell of a question. Uh, it would have been a long time ago, probably when I was around 12 or 13. I think I was 12 years old when I watched Sunset Boulevard for the first time, 13 when I watched Seven Samurai for the first time. That's where it starts. Like, I, I tend to look at those two specific movies, as I think is attested to by Sunset Boulevard being you know, one of the formative films and like making me someone who likes classic films as a teenager. Uh, I feel like the Billy Wilder factor was potentially a thing. Like I probably discovered that Billy Wilder had co-written Ninochka. And I was like, mm. okay, well, I like this Wilder fella. I've seen, you know, a few of his films at this point. I'll check out some of his screenplays. And Ninochka being just such a, I will leave you to talk about that when the time comes. But I th certainly think it's a, a fabulous, fabulous movie. Uh, incredibly sophisticated and incre incredibly elegant, but not in the kind of like, like, sh like there's a way that Hollywood films of the 30s are elegant that feels kind of shallow and frivolous. And with Lubitsch, it feels more like it's sort of, it like goes down to the bone, this like awareness of surfaces and of like the culture that produces these costumes and locations and whatnot. Um, so great movie immediately made me want to seek out more of his stuff. I think I went from, I like Lubitsch to a Lubitsch super fan, uh, probably trouble in paradise that film is to me still to this day the gold standard for dirty pre-code movies mm -hmm. that are still really clever despite also being just like genuinely almost sordid in their content and there's a specific line from trouble in paradise it's where the the male lead is is 
uh, sort of yelling at the woman that he's trying to con. He says, this is, you know, shameful. If I were the, the state of your papers, your, your financial <laughs> papers is shameful. If I were your father, I would spank you. And she says, what would you do if my, you were my accountant? And he says, the same. It's like, okay, <laughs> this is, this is good cinema. This is, this is what I want. And I think that kind of gets to the question of why should people still care about, you know, this old dead German uh, emigre? His films are really smart. They're really sophisticated. They have a, a worldliness and a knowingness about sex, but about other things as well, you know, about fashion, about the way that people like, like nice things and sort of the cost to them personally of being someone who cares about nice things. Uh, they're just these very urbane cosmopolitan films that I think are very intelligent about the kinds of humans who occupy these spaces, both as what makes them wonderful and witty and lovable, but also sort of what makes them brittle and willing to harm other people just as they like laugh and things like that. And I, I think that's really what it is for me is like, he feels very, not even timeless. He feels contemporary in a way because he is talking with such, you know, brilliant frankness about these very complicated subjects that are hard to find in 30s movies and frankly no less hard to find in contemporary cinema like i think that kind of openness about just about like cosmopolitan pop culture and that fascination and how it works is just not usual and i think that remains just fascinating one question i have you've expressed a, a kind of a, a preference for in particular his pre-code films especially maybe over maybe your opinions have changed on this but his Hayes era movies mm -hmm. right his his later stuff with maybe the exception of Clooney Brown in terms of just you know what you see as pinnacles of Lubitsch do you think that anything was lost in that do you think he was particularly vulnerable to these strictures of the Hayes code or what's your read on that I mean I certainly think that a filmmaker who is as interested in people's sex lives as Lubitsch is. And he is very interested in sex, not in like a prurient way. And he like, this is a major part of how humans interact with the world and each other. Let's dig into that. Let's have fun with it. Let's sort of prod at these sexual anxieties and whatnot. Um, and you can't do that except in a very heavily, heavily coded way. And, you know, Clooney Brown, I like for sort of weird reasons, even within Lubitsch, <laughs> but I would point again to something like Ninochka as a movie that is finding ways to be about that, but it, it has to like filter it and, you know, put it through all these sort of codes and symbolism that, you know, all movies during the Hayes era used. And that does, I think, take away some of its ingenuity, maybe like it can't be mm -hmm. quite as on point in diagnosing what it's trying to diagnose about people's psychology. Uh, that being said, there are several of his, his post 34 films that I do deeply love, I think are very funny. I don't love them as much. I mean, that's that's quite true. And, and a big part of it is that I think he lost a little bit of that sort of knife sharp incisiveness with, uh, mm -hmm. with which he sort of diagnosed cultural mores. I still think there's there's a lot of really beautifully constructed jokes. I think there's a lot of great performances. And certainly uh, in a film like Ninochka or a film like To Be or Not To Be, there's still a lot of very intelligent social commentary. It's just, it's taken a different form. As I've become more and more familiar with the all the various eras of Lubitsch, um, one thing that strikes me is his ability to bend to circumstances. Um, and one of those was, you know, the Hayes Code, and, but also sound and just moving to Hollywood, being someone who who's working in their non-native language. Mm -hmm. This kind of touches upon the eyes of Mami Ma, his ability to, or his willingness at least, maybe not his ability quite yet, <laughs> to shift modes and genres. Because up until this point, he had been almost exclusively, I think, give or take a lot, you know, a lost film or two, where I have no way of knowing, um, a comedy director. And this is his first or oldest surviving, we should say, uh, drama film. And this sparked off a series of essentially dramatic historical epics mm -hmm. that was what the market demanded <laughs> he listens to what the needs of the local economy what what the market wants what the audiences want and, and works with that and and we can see that throughout so that's that's fascinated me but no, I, I think it's telling in that context um he spends time in the 30s as the head of production at paramount mm -hmm. he has a sense of what audiences want like that's not a position that an artist gets that's a position that a good savvy businessman someone who can read the market someone who can read audience tastes uh that that's the person who gets that job i think it's very telling um you know as you point out he is not a native speaker of english i don't really know how strong of a command he had of the language later in life um again to 
go back to Billy Wilder, one of his regular collaborators. Uh, Wilder never really had a great handle on English. Like he always mm-hmm. had a sort of very, very pronounced uh, accent. We have this, you know, immigrant doesn't speak the language as fluently, obviously, as a, a native born director would, uh, who basically he's one of the co-inventors of the musical, which is kind mm-hmm. of the celebration of lyricism and, you know, singing and sound and all of these things. And I think that is a testament to how well he's able to rebuild himself when the conditions in which he's working need to change. It's tough to know whether this is apocryphal or not, but some have posited, some of his colleagues have posited in later interviews and such that it's possible he actually pretended to have less of a grasp of English language in certain situations Mm. that benefited him. One thing that I think is true and strikes me is that if you listen to the very limited footage we have of him speaking English and compare that to the way that all of his actors speak in his Mm. films, and then you think of the fact that he had a habit of literally walking through scenes in front of actors and saying all the lines to rehearse and to lay out his expectations, you can start to really see, especially if you cross-reference the performances of actors in his films versus the same actors in other films, in Lubitsch films, they all talk like Lubitsch. That's amazing. They have a cadence to them that I I haven't heard anywhere else. And it's subtle, but I'm convinced it's there. If you listen to Carol Lombard talking to be or not to be versus her work in like all the other things, like my man Godfrey, you know, 20th century, et cetera, et cetera, different cadence, distinctly mm-hmm. different. If, if we can just dive right in, I don't know how much backstory you want to go. I do think Guys of Mummy Ma is a good case study for him working with actors insofar as it does have two two white dwarf stars with a very strong uh, gravitational pull, as it were. Like These are two actors who just had a thing that they did. And I like that thing, but I think it is very weird and very dated, so I get someone not liking that thing. But uh, I do think it's interesting that this is not an Ernst Lubitsch performance, as I conceive of it being given by Emil Jannings. This is an Emil Jannings performance, and he's kind of bursting through whatever his director, I think, had in mind for him in some ways. It is very interesting because if uh, if you've ever seen Ernst Lubitsch act on camera, and I think he acts in four of his surviving films, he is a massive ham. <laughs> okay. He is just like utter ham. And and it works like in the last film, uh, I Don't Want to Be a Man, Ossie Oswald is also a ham, but it works. I mean, it's it, her character is designed to be hammy. And in the context of this real, I mean, this is a melodrama, this film, um, in the context of this like over the top theatrical drama, it's interesting. It, my reaction to really change scene by scene because mm-hmm. on one hand, you know, so basically Emil Yannings plays Radu, who is this Egyptian. He has taken Pola Negri, who plays an uh, Egyptian woman prisoner in a tomb for two years and she is then sprung by a german traveler emil yannings in full blackface <laughs> which must be said uh, is at his full like arm wavy ham mm-hmm. i find that this is both his hammiest performance that i've seen but it also feels of a piece with the hamminess i see elsewhere in him um mm-hmm. i think he's just a big presence he's just like guy who is going to be the thing you're looking at in frame, both because he towers over his co-stars and also because he's doing things to draw your eye. And this film, certainly, he's doing a ton of things. He is posing, he is gesticulating, he is burrowing his eyes, which are just all the brighter and more like visible because he is, as you point out, in blackface. And I think Pola Negri is as well. It's like almost like a bronzer, I guess. It's like a bronzer, but like there's definitely lots of makeup going on in some very unfortunate ways in this movie. There is. And and um, Yannings is interesting because he, at this point, Lubitsch was still frequently, in every single film up to this point, he, actors played literally to the camera, right? Like they, they, I think we've had a fourth wall break in every single film so far. And, and in some, like over half the movie is, consists of fourth wall breaks in the case of like, um, where's my treasure? But in this, um, there's a little bit of that too, where at one point, and I found this very interesting, after he had, at least thinks he has killed, we haven't confirmed it yet, Paula Negri, he picks up her body and then kind of presents it to the camera as mm-hmm. if like like she's dead, right? <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly have a piece of like Yannings in the Mary Jail, like looking at the camera and raising his eyebrows comically. And you know, okay. so it's like the it's like the melodramatic inverse of that. And you know, this is this is part of what you get when you have, you know, theater trained actors in movies. But I think even then there's a, a level of certain people wanted to stylize their performances even more to make that happen. And and I do think Yannings is very clearly one of them who's like by the standards of the silent acting at any given part of his career, 
he is doing something old fashioned and stagey. Like yes. this, is, this is not what silent acting looks like. And, and the kind of that kind of um, self awareness of the camera, like. Lubitsch held on to that for a very long time. I mean, mm -hmm. um, every time I see it in this, I'm reminded of like the fact that Maurice Chevalier is looking at you for 90% of all of his the musicals he's in. Yeah, no, Maurice Chevalier was very much where my mind went uh, during a lot of, of this movie in terms of the presentation of it, the sort of very grand, like theatrical gesture of it. I think it is, to be clear, better in every one of the uh, Maurice <laughs> Chevalier films, or at least the films are better and therefore it feels better. I think that is a probably uh, not an opinion that will ever get much pushback <laughs> <laughs> from, anyone, from the eight people who have seen this. The bigness of him and Polo Negri, um, of which I, I should mention that this is Polo Negri's first collaboration with Ernst Lubitsch, and this will become, she will become very relevant. Both of them kind of rise together to become two of the most famous film artists in the world mm -hmm. um, within two years of this. Uh, back to the whole of a piece thing. Uh, this film is definitely part of this Orientalist mm -hmm. craze that was going on at the time, especially in regards to Egypt. I mean, we were, they were what, three years away from discovering King Tut's tomb. And so you had this burgeoning interest um, in Egypt. So this kind of bigness and very stereotyped gestures, it's in, in, a, in, a, in a very troubling colonialist way. It is a artistic match to the mm -hmm. subject matter. Yeah. And I mean, we, we could here make a, a snotty joke about Emil Yannings being a perfect artistic match to a <laughs> a racist colonialist movie but you know but no i i do think uh there is a level of caricature in the character and just in the story you pointed out it's a melodrama it's a particularly like we're hitting all the formula type melodrama like it mm -hmm. is not clever storytelling the narrative stereotyping the cultural stereotyping the sort of stereotyping of like location like we sort of see a very like haunted house version of egypt in a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. based on what we can see of it. I think all of this is a very good match for the kind of big, gaudy, I'm not even trying to create a character, I'm just trying to create like a vibe of like bulging eyes and flailing arms that both of the actors are bringing. I don't know if that makes it worse or if that sort of helps make some of the, uh, the weird, tacky exoticism go down a little smoother for me, but it definitely, it's all one thing. I think mm. we can at least say that much. It's interesting to me that, in my opinion, at least, the only character in this with a meaningful internal life is the Polonegri character because she actually has wants and desires that don't quite fit into that exact skeletal melodrama plot. Like, I like the detail of her homesickness is mm -hmm. what sparks her to wear that kind of the clothes, you know, she associates with her character's culture. And then that sparks, you know, the dance. Little moments like that do stick out in this film as, sure. oh, this is not entirely skeletal in every single way, but it is that's, mostly. That's very fair. I think a lot of, of what re reads as depth in her character, and I agree, like she is the only one here who has anything resembling a, like actual interiority. Uh, I feel it's like- depth -like. <laughs> It's depth-like. It's depth-like. I think we notice it because it is very isolated in this movie. I don't think if this were, how to put this, if this were a good movie, I don't think that would be quite as like salient. <laughs> It's interesting too, like the kind of um, uh, much more than I don't want to be a man, there is a distinct lack of what you, I mean, what we would stereotypically call the Lubitsch touch here. There's a character we're introduced to, a variety show agent, and we cut to him, tow card, variety show agent. You know, even just, uh, you know, the Lubitsch of not just later, but of I don't want to be a man would probably found a way to kind of cleverly and slyly make us understand that that is a variety show agent <laughs> and not just had to confront us with a title card it's it's very very flat like it, it tells us what the story is going to be and then presents it and you know it's i think it's unfair to in some ways hold an artist accountable to who they will be 20 years later 15 years later however long uh but i i certainly was watching this you know in the hopes of seeing the sapling that would grow into the beautiful oak tree of, of mature <laughs> lubich and there isn't very much of it and that's just that's real for me the places where it felt most like Lubitsch had very little to do with the plot or the characters. It was mostly mm. in the middle part of the film when our uh, our extremely boring German painter tourist, <laughs> whose name, I, I want to say it's Max, but that just might be because Max is like the stereotypical name for a German in the 20s. So our painter, you know, brings Ma, the Pola Negri character, who is been pretending to be a mummy brings her back to whatever city it is they land in and 
And then there's like a kind of tour of the upper classes, like upper middle classes, like the sort of bourgeois spaces where like interesting cocktail parties happen and humans are paraded around. It's like, oh, look at this exotic specimen I found in Egypt. And that is the place where this feels like a movie directed by anyone with any kind of personality to me is like the precision with which he kind of understands those spaces and the people who move through them and how they kind of inhabit three-dimensional space. You can see a growing ambition with his crowd compositions in depth. Absolutely. The crowd specifically. He has this way of um, choreographing groups of well-dressed people in ways where they all move as a single form. Mm-hmm. That is, it was it was significantly more, I think, interesting in the previous film, I Don't Want to Be a Man, but it's, it's here. So there's that. One other thing I found interesting was, we can uh, use this as a bridge to get into like the, the quality of the transfer and the state of it too. The rate of the editing was massively faster massive the average shot length is feels like half of i don't want to be a man oh, especially in terms of establishing shots where oftentimes it'll it's like establishing shot 24 frames later we're, we're out and there was a couple of cases where to me at least i'm like oh that's a real change where they lost some frames you know but there's other cases where there's a few in a row where i'm like wow he is rocketing through this coverage basically mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was new and i and i wonder whether that's again it's 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 this is where we can really tackle the transfer. It's hard to tell what is a fault of the fact that this is a 57 minute, you know, a very rough version of of a film that was likely at least a little bit longer and what is actual artistic intent on Lubitsch's part. So we watched the same version. I, I do not exactly know its provenance. It was a pretty beat up copy of the film. We, we chatted about this before the show, but uh, there is a plot relevant letter. <laughs> that is shown on screen for quite some time. And it is even granting that I don't have any German, I wouldn't have been able to read it if I could see it. It's not legible. Like I could make (laughs) out individual (laughs) letters, but I could certainly not make out words, let alone sentences. I I tried sharpening it and like upscaling it in in Photoshop and it was just nothing. Not a chance. Not a chance. The info is not there. So, So that's kind of, I think, the most egregious case. But, you know, one of the things... Certainly that I respond to in Lubitsch, in all of his films that I've seen, you know, his silence, even the handful of silence I've seen, he is a director who is very attentive to the physicality of his sets, Mm -hmm. right? Like he cares about, again, he cares about the places where things happen. It's the reason why we think of the mature Lubitsch style as being about people closing doors behind them, right? Like he cares about his sets. And there's this, you know, Egyptian set like the the tomb where the mummy ma like hides and scares tourists and that's how they make their money it feels like it's supposed to be atmospheric it's, it feels like we're supposed to be like descending into this like extremely ancient cobwebby damp you know all the all the terms you come up with out of this you know sort of exoticized horror literature from the teens and 20s uh, but it, it doesn't read that way. It just reads as like a bunch of smeary gray blocking. And especially because you got Kurt Richter on the production design and with the UFA money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the, the, this is massively higher production value than anything Lubitsch has done before. And uh, it would be lovely to see it. <laughs> it would. It's tough. And there's also, you know, as you pointed out, are we really seeing the editing or are we seeing some sort of reconstruction? And even, you know, when you were talking about the sort of crudeness with which he introduces the uh, the variety show agent, we don't know that that title card was Lubitsch's intention. Like, mm-hmm. we can assume, I think it's probably a reasonably fair guess given the way that sequence is set up. Like, there's not really anything else introducing that character. But title cards get interpolated, right? Like, I mean, even at the time, like different title cards were used in different markets based on, you know, local. Would an American be able to understand this German thing? Well, maybe not. We have to put a title card in. But then also, you know, as we lose reliable prints of the originals, often, you know, people make their best guess. And I think a title card would probably have gone here. And they know, in a sense, we are always when we're watching a silent film in a lot of ways, because silent films, I think tend to seem like they're in better shape than they necessarily are. And I'm Mm -hmm. thinking of this, and I'm going to go on a slight tangent here. I recently watched for the first time, I rewatched the entire filmography of uh, Charles Chaplin. And when I got to The Gold Rush, I watched the 1925 version. But of course, the 1925 version, as we watch it today, is not the 1925 version. It's a reconstruction from the 80s or maybe the 70s. It's someone's best guess. It's a very, you know, intelligent film scholar's best guess that this is probably what it looked like in 1925, but we aren't watching the film from 1925. And I think that's true of a lot of silence. 
the thing that we're watching isn't necessarily the film that was supposed to be seen in a lot of ways. So I think that's always a danger with watching films this old. And then it becomes compounded when we were watching what is just obviously an, an insufficient print, as, as you and I did here. To build a tangent from that tangent, I mean, you, you really get tricky when you get into like films that have no fixed shape. The first one that comes to mind is Napoleon, where mm-hmm. the version of Napoleon that is one of my favorite movies ever is not the A. Bogant's version of Napoleon that premiered at one of its two major kind of forms in the mid to late 20s. It is the collaboration between Kevin Brownlow and A. Bogant's that occurred over a period of decades Mm -hmm. in the later half of the 20th century that created the film I love. And the idea of what the heck is Napoleon anyways is almost unanswerable because there's no canonical version. I mean, even like the score, which to me is a you know, integral part of the film. Uh, I will always associate that score with that movie that was written by Carl Davis, who was not born when Napoleon came out. And, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up music because I have been grappling as long as I've been a fan of silent films, which has been, you know, certainly more than half of my life at this point. To what degree is the music something you were permitted to even talk about when you're talking about one of these movies? Because it's like, it is not the fault of Ernst Lubitsch and anyone else working in 1918 Berlin who like they did not pick this music they did not slap it on that was composed in 2011 i think but it is part of the aesthetic experience and you know we're reminded when we study silent film these films were not meant to be seen silent they were meant to be seen with music that was meant to be something that augmented the experience the filmmakers relied on that and hoped and prayed they would get you know actually talented musicians creating those scores for them uh in the cases where there wasn't a dedicated score which the version of this <laughs> film I watched did have a score. And again, it is not Lubitsch's fault that it had this score, but it certainly did not encourage my enjoying the experience of watching it. Oh, you're going to love the doll because I had to turn that score off. It's a great transfer wow. but Anya and I were, were watching it and we were like we cannot countenance this score holy lord it makes uh Rick DeJong's work in for this score look like a Beethoven's ninth that's horrifying watch the doll like I I, I put on like the nearest Mozart symphony at hand just to have, just something, to have yeah. something and uh it significantly improves the experience and it's a good I think it's know. an unbelievably good film but it, it does I mean as a counter example I mean uh student prince in old Heidelberg I don't know if you've seen the Thames TV version of that that um Brownlow and Carl Davis worked on which is easily my favorite Lubitsch silent and I still cannot separate out my feelings from the score I, I have had only a very small number of films of silence where I just could not deal with the attached score, but my God, it can, it can torpedo the experience of watching it. Sort of my go-to example of an, I cannot watch this film with this piece of music. The Buster Keaton short one week, his first like solo short after he parted ways with Fatty Arbuckle. Mm-hmm. Uh, the version that was for years, like the standard one that you could get like on all the Kino uh, releases of Buster Keaton stuff, which was kind of, I think, still the main way to see it. It was this horrible, like, Casio keyboard, like, <laughs> bah, bah, bah. and like, it's so cheesy and corny. It like steps on the jokes of what is, I think, one of his funniest films. So, like, that's a, an experience where I regularly am just like, nope, I'm just going to watch it silent. It's still going to be funnier than if I try to watch it with that. Well, what are your thoughts on the, the visions of light score for uh, Joan of Arc? That is the other example of the silent that I almost exclusively watch without mm-hmm. music. I think sil- I think Visions of Light is a beautiful piece of music that insists on itself in a way that I do not want to have something insist on when I'm watching that movie. I think that's um, the growing consensus among silent film appreciators I know, including myself, that that score is it serves the film as a film poorly, uh, at least thematically. Yes. <laughs> And, and I will also point out, it is timed to a projection of the film at 24 frames As per well. second, which is not the correct projection of that film. It's an interesting case because, I mean, uh, uh, like uh, the idea of revisionist scores for classic films is interesting to me because I think there's there's really good ones. Like I, I do love the Marauder Metropolis as an alternative viewing experience. But uh, the thing that kind of I retroactively kind of resented was... I first saw The Passion of Joan of Arc with the Visions of Light score, not as like, here's an alternate mm-hmm. presentation, but here's The Passion of Joan of Arc. 
I feel like my first experience with that film was misrepresentation of the actual artistic intent of that film because of that score, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that is that is the one silent feature that I think actually needs to be seen silent mm-hmm. to me. And maybe maybe it's just nostalgia because that's how I've always watched it. I don't know. It's all about the just the intensity of faces and like no music is going to be able to to augment that. It's just going to get in the way. But uh, we have we have done a very good job of running far away from the eyes of Mumi Ma. Why would that that's be the case? Good. It's, it is. I mean, I mean, for me, the most interesting part of the film is truly the fact that this is such a turning point for Lubitsch as a as a maker of productions, mm-hmm. right? It's things are only going to get bigger. It's, I mean, arguably climaxes. I've not seen all the films from season two yet, but you know, this, as far as I know, climaxes size wise with, with the uh, loves of the Pharaoh mm-hmm. in, in a few years and like eight episodes from now, <laughs> um, where you have these giant, you know, cast of thousands crowd scenes also in Egypt. This film is important because it sets the trajectory for Lubitsch, the director of epics, which is, Strangely enough, the thing that he would spend the rest of his Berlin career being most well known for. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like The Oyster Princess and Wildcat. It was Loves the Pharaoh, um, Passion, a.k.a. Man and DuBerry, that sort of thing that made his name in in America. Which is fascinating twice over because, A, that's just not what we think of when we think of Lubitsch in, you know, the 2020s. But even what I know of his American silence, like there's... There's high production value. It's you know they're Hollywood movies compared to anywhere else in the world at that point in time. Obviously, they're high production value. They're like high production value chamber dramas. He's not making DeMille films in the United States. What we see in the eyes of of Mummy Ma does not suggest to me that Lubitsch, the great epic director, is something that I feel we lost. <laughs> like it doesn't. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have an eye for it. You know, like some of the early scenes. And again, we're watching just something that looks like absolute hell, especially, I think, in its first couple of reels, where it does sort of, I think, rely more on spectacle and a sort of exoticized Egyptian setting. But in this, there's this early sequence where our, our German painter friend is like, like Lawrence of Arabia style tromping his way across a desert. And there, there's such pedestrian <laughs> images. And I mean, I'm trying to watch through the print you know not actually look at the image so it's tough to say yeah it's just tough to know what's because there's so little detail exactly uh, it's tough to know like maybe the, the the texture of the sand was poetic or something i mean i can that's something i can easily believe it was and that's what makes it tough to talk about you know i'm watching the sequence and i'm i'm sitting here thinking this is this is nothing this is just like sort of generic desert boilerplate and i think there's two things there a one must remind themselves this was from 1918 Was that boilerplate yet in 1918? I don't know. But then there is that thing of like, this surely looked better. So like, I have to augment my, my evaluation of what's working and not based on that. It's interesting too. Like the the question of what films are worth the time. Philosophically, I think every film that exists needs to be restored given a, you know all the love but i think realistically that's not going to happen anytime within my lifetime that at what point should we get to films like the eyes of the mummy ma and preserve them for posterity in like 8k resolution whatever we're doing it in 20 years um because i spent a lot of time loudly saying my god we've all missed the boat on the student prince of old heidelberg why does that not exist in pristine quality why is there not a blu-ray that we can all point to. Why do I have to pirate an old Thames TV release? Mm -hmm. And then for this, at a certain point, I I don't have the energy to advocate for restoring a film like this, even though I probably should. I I completely get that. And I think that is a a good question. And I, I fully agree with you on the philosophical point, like any movie that can get restored deserves a restoration. And there's part of me, you know, as a, as a historian, like I, I want access to the middling films, like the the just the average mm-hmm. stuff, the 1910s version of like Black Adam or Morbius, you know, like I want to know what that looked like for those people at that time. Like, it's easy to say, like, let's, you know, look at the canonical masterpieces, but we don't learn about a film culture by looking at the canonical masterpieces. We look at it by looking at sort of the cross section of, of mediocre shit, basically. Uh, so part of me is like, I want that restored. Mm-hmm. And part of me is like, you know, a, a major filmmaker like Lubitsch that we're going to do as we're doing, you know, deep dives across his entire chronology, like anything that still exists, we should preserve. And I think that's certainly been a, a tendency we've seen with um, Alfred Hitchcock. There was 
some years back two reels of a film that he like assistant directed or something and discovered <laughs> it was like we have to preserve the two reels that were assistant directed by hitchcock it's like do we i'm not sure about that i do think there's an intrinsic interest there it is tough to be like i think we should spend the five million dollars necessary to make this film more pleasurable for the 15 humans who want to see it and that is a tough decision to, to sort of grapple with. You know, I spoke with um, Dave Kerr from the MoMA um, about his the kind of restorations that he was involved in of the four Lubitsch silence that he, uh, I think they were Marriage Circle, Lady Windermere's Fan, Forbidden Paradise and Rosita. And I asked, oh, why haven't you done student principal Heidelberg? And his basic answer was to paraphrase him. Those four films took so much time and capital. Basically, we literally do not have resources to get to everything. And that makes perfect sense. And that's the answer I was expecting. But it's an interesting thing. How do we triage these things? <laughs> and I've seen uh, two of those restorations they played at the film festival here in Madison. And Rosita is, to me, just an absolute phenomenal thing and it's a phenomenal thing we wouldn't have access to if it hadn't been restored and would i have known in advance like here's this random ruritanian melodrama comedy like who gives a shit but at the same time it's like well i do now that i've seen it i want it you know a little bit closer to home you know attached to to the school where i'm, I'm doing my, my phd work we have a fairly substantial film archive the wisconsin center for film and theater research and they recently digitized every copy of the one season television show that they have, like, for some reason, every, every copy, they have every episode of a copy of it. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but it was basically a, a, a police procedural where it was like the parachute core, essentially, like mm -hmm. these two skydivers had to skydive in and save the day. And it was always like, skydive themed crimes basically <laughs> and it's like hey how could this conceivably have had enough legs to even produce one full season but i was able to see an episode because again they digitized the entire run and they were like look at what we have now and it's like this is actually a fascinating relic of some weird moment in culture where they're like you know what's cool skydiving and i'm grateful that i was able to <laughs> see it i'm grateful to know that that moment in cultural history existed is there intrinsic artistic merit to this show absolutely not it was <laughs> very silly but i'm glad it exists i i think that maintain that cross-section is so important i mean the whole sisyphean enterprise of this podcast you know spending the first mm. two darn seasons on a largely i mean at least half aesthetically not all that major mm -hmm. <laughs> series of films for me there's intrinsic value in, in knowing and being able to trace the trajectory of the great artists absolutely and you know i as i mentioned i rewatched all of chaplin uh recently and a lot of those early chaplin shorts are just the same old damn slapstick over and over again uh very very flat very whatever but i'm glad i did it i'm glad i got to see that sort of shift across his you know years working in silent short films at the same time, I have to ask myself, like, I'm so glad that these Chaplin shorts exist in such pristine condition. But do I really want to say, like, if we're faced with the conundrum of, well, we can either save this really mediocre Chaplin short film, or we can use those those resources to, you know, we just found this print of Four Devils and we can save that instead. It's like, well, obviously <laughs> we're going to prioritize the masterpiece. I love how Four Devils is such this is such a touchstone of this. It's the first thing I thought of immediately, too. How is it not, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like Four Devils and London After Midnight are the two. And by all accounts, London After Midnight wasn't actually good. So it's Four Devils. Actually, I have a question. Obviously, discounting films that we know are likely lost, like films that you think are gettable. Mm -hmm. Of that universe of films that are gettable, but don't have a decent restoration in the silent era, if you could pick one, major, make a wave, wave a magic wand and go, you're getting a 4K and it's getting the, the worldwide release. Would you have a pick? Oh, I would need to think about it. I, I, have, <laughs> I have so many that I want. I think I do. Actually, it's an obvious pick. I think it is shamefully hard to see either of the extant cuts of greed. There's there's the there's the theatrical cut from 1925 and the the borderline unwatchable reconstruction of what a longer version might have looked like if we still had that footage. Again, neither version. I don't even know if Greed ever made it to DVD. It certainly didn't make it to Blu-ray. It's funny. I always thought of Greed as a film that had at least some decent representation, but the four hour reconstruction was such a big deal when it happened in the mid 90s. But we're still, you know, it was the VHS age when that restoration happened. 
And that's like one of the films that everybody agrees is like a stone cold silent film masterpiece. And it's tough to find. And so part of it's like, well, we should be able to find that. And part of it's like, so think of all the films we, we don't even know that we don't have because they're not greed. Exactly. I mean, uh, there's, so, I mean, you can lump them to so many categories, right? Films that probably don't exist anymore. Films that are probably languishing in some storage facility somewhere, someone's basement that are gettable if we had the if we had unlimited funding or whatever mm-hmm. and then there's stuff that exists is out there but no one has bothered to maintain it so i mean there's a decent amount of movies where the only version available digitally is this horrible tv rip from 20 years ago and there's no other mm-hmm. version because some warehouse burnt down and yeah i feel it's almost easier to ask the question or answer the question what silent films have been presented appropriately because really mm-hmm. i feel like that list is heavily dominated by chaplin and keaton shorts or, or films in general mm-hmm. Once you get past that, like those silent comedians, silent film has not been treated with love. No. Yeah. You know, there's there's exceptions like the the Murnau Stiftung has done some really great work keeping a, a lot of silent German films sort of in circulation and in pretty good versions. I got the Brown Law Restoration of Napoleon, so I'm kind of happy forever because I, I thought I'd never get it. Yeah, I was, I was about to turn the question around on you. What would your your one film if you had your magic wand or do you have it? I do have the, the one like the, Napoleon was for I, I saw in 2012 at the San Francisco Silent Film Festival or like an offshoot in Oakland. And that was the best movie experience of my life. Then it took well, it took like 2017, I think, was when I finally got the Blu-ray from it had a limited run from the BFI region two only, right? Right? or whatever the the uh, UK's region and I always forget because I have a region for flavor yes B that was my like you know Moby Dick yeah. <laughs> so I feel like I got my wish but right now it's definitely student prints because that film it's it's an unsung masterpiece of my favorite director and it exists in mildly watchable form but it's clearly like a a, a copy of a copy of a TV broadcast right Mm -hmm. Um, which is a real shame and you know and this is this is not a problem that's limited to silent films either i mean i'm sure everyone listening to this knows that but like there are plenty of recent films that have just been allowed to kind of rot i mean Mm -hmm. the famous example being star wars the the star wars negatives were almost unusable when lucas went back to polish it up and add cgi gym cracks in uh 1997 and i mean if a, if a film like star wars cannot be appropriately archived and preserved what hope is there for literally any other film look at every uh hitchcock vista vision film except for north by northwest i think mm-hmm. 100 and i forget who had control i think it was an mgm like kept north by northwest in this like in you know a proper vault right and uh, that film looks incredible and all the other stuff you've had robert harris beating his head against the wall for 20 years to restore exactly uh, exactly one thing that we can say on the silver lining here is that I believe every single Ernst Lubitsch talkie is around. We haven't lost any of them. Oh, duh. I was going to say, have we lost any of his American silence? It's like we lost the Patriot, obviously. Yeah, that's the big one. That's the one. If I, that's the yeah. big one. It is, it is the solitary film that stands between me and having seen every Best Picture nominee. I mean, the fact is we have like that uncertain feeling now. I, I can just watch it any time. We have Monte Carlo. We have it's like Monte Carlo. Perfect example of a film that I frankly don't like, but we can we have it. Yeah, we we do. can understand where it belongs in 1931. We can or 32. We can understand where it belongs in Lubitsch. Like it's useful to have it, even if I find it <laughs> surely his worst talking. Well, I mean, you, you do have the lovely song where Jack Buchanan and his friends sing about sing the most suggestive song ever written about haircuts. Shy guys and those who feel that they have no sex appeal get a lot of chances for romances for women, women. So I, I cannot dislike that movie for that one that's scene. A, that's I, I respect that. <laughs> I think that's like, it's like everything I had to say about this movie, which is probably the I just, least I have to say about any of Lubitsch's movies. I was going to say, I feel like we spent more than half of this time not talking about this movie, which is in and of itself uh, telling about what a non-experience it is to watch it. I'm here for Yawnings and Negri flapping their arms around and, and pulling faces, but it's it's not for everybody. And even if it is for you, there's better ways to get both of them doing that. Oh, yes. Oh, we're about to see some examples of that in the next few episodes. The, thank you so much for lending your time to this. It's it's my absolute pl- pleasure. Lubitsch is, he's my boy. I'm always happy to come on and talk even about his weird arcane misfires. Yep. <laughs> Uh, folks, you can find Tim Brayton at alternating.com. He has, I will say, a spectacularly entertaining letterbox. Oh, thank you. Also runs his own podcast with his colleagues. It's also spectacularly entertaining. Thank you so much for, I mean, the, again, I bet we're going to get like 
single digit listeners on this one episode, but what, you know, someone can hope. You know, it's <laughs> I will I will listen to it multiple times if that's what it takes to boost it above ten. Next week, Jose Arroyo joins us to discuss Carmen. Head over to www.ernstcast.com for the links to the various public domain films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes. How Would Lubitsch Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast service you happen to use. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. 